Many of us are aware of what happened in Jamia, but uh, the enormity of police brutality and violence in AMU is not sufficiently known. Uh, many of us responded immediately after Jamia. We were at the police stations that night. Uh, a whole uh, bunch of people gathered in front of the police station uh, through the night. And that was what sparked off a whole nationwide series of, uh, of, of protests in solidarity initially with the students of Jamia and AMU and leading on to uh, the much larger questions of the defense of our constitution itself. Uh, but we felt that we needed to really understand what happened in AMU. And please understand <coughs> the events of AMU happened on 15th night. We were there by the 17th. And, uh, and so we were there very soon after. But in this short period of time, uh, the university had cleared out, the university administration had cleared out around 21,000 students in the course of this small period. It was clear that they just didn't want them around because they thought that that would quell the protests. Uh, their students there from Kashmir and from the Northeast, uh, their students who are poor. Uh, the administration said we did organize buses for them. There were women students. But by the time we reached, most of the students had, had already been uh, 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 flushed out, I would say, from the university. But uh, I would give credit to the faculty of, of, of AMU who were very concerned and wanted to stand in solidarity. So, uh, so I, we had a very unusual, because uh, we, we went at short notice, but they told us that in their staff club, they have gathered and we found almost 100 <coughs> teachers waiting for us. And from them we heard a lot of what unfolded. We also met uh, a number of students uh, but every one of them was so terrified and 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 made sure that you know uh, uh, that we would retain <coughs> their anonymity. The reasons for their fear was that they had been told in completely uncertain terms, and this was told to us over and over again, that if they complain, uh, they would uh, be removed or expelled from the university, and also criminal charges like under the NSA would be filed against the students. And the students were therefore completely terrified and unwilling to come on record. Uh, uh, we also went to the hospital and met uh, students who were injured. And we met a lot of the doctors. The doctors were saying they're the only set of people who have not been cleared out of the campus because the hospital had to run uh, based on you know the interns and the registrars. And they were a source of information as well. Uh, after me, uh, two other members, uh, the most senior members of the, uh, uh, of the team, uh, John Dial and Natasha Badwar, would also uh, briefly share some findings. Uh, but we wanted on this panel to get a set of uh, 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 people to comment on, 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 on what they saw. Uh, Mr. Chamandal is one of our most respected uh, uh, re retired police officers who's stood by uh, the defense of human rights uh, at every stage. Uh, we have Sa Saida Hamid who has a very long emotional association with uh, Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, we have uh, Atul Sood uh, who, uh, who actually we, we could not get the faculty from Aligarh. They did not also want to be named and, and mentioned. Uh, but uh, Atul is, uh, has been uh, coordinating uh, the solidarity, as I would say, of the teachers of JNU with the students there. And we felt we'd like to hear his word. And, uh, and finally, Geeta Hariharan, uh, uh, Geeta's uh, two colleagues had also accompanied us from the Indian Cultural Forum. And uh, we, uh, I would request her to finally sum up. That's how we do this uh, uh, quick afternoon. Um, I, I want to just start with two or three broad observations. Uh, I've been in the IAS, I've seen a lot of law and order situations uh, in universities and outside. I have never seen anything like what I saw in Aligarh. 
uh, I have never seen the, a university ad administration to, uh, which so abandons uh, its students uh, uh, to a state which is clearly, uh, as, I, as I wrote, uh, pitiless and, and brutal to the students. Uh, I was amazed to find that a serving IPS officer of the UP cadre of 2006 batch is appointed as the registrar. And he's going to go back after his deputation to the same uh, police administration uh, led by uh, uh, Mr. Adityanath. Uh, and his attitude when we spoke to him was, uh, was extraordinarily uh, casual, pro-police, uh, and with no sense of solidarity with the students. Uh, I'll talk about two students whose m memories will stay with me. Uh, one of them we met uh, on, the, uh, on, on his hospital bed. Uh, this was, remember, this was just 17th morning. On 15th night, his hand had got blown off and amputated. Uh, the kind of equanimity uh, and grace he showed was something that I don't think I could have mustered uh, in his place. Uh, his only concern at that stage was, uh, how will I let my mother know and will she survive this? Uh, he, he said that uh, he saw uh, you know, tear gas shells and they had been told that if you pick up a tear gas shell and throw it on water, its impact will get reduced. So he was trying to do that. It turned out to be something else which exploded in his hand. And uh, the registrar himself spoke very casually that we, the police used stun grenades. Uh, I know stun grenades is something that explodes with huge noise and, 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 and burst of light which stuns you into, uh, for a period. It's normally something that you use in, you know, against terrorists, uh, uh, you know, in, or, or, or very dangerous criminals when you're trying to get to them. Uh, I have never heard of it being used against uh, civilian populations, least of all against students. Uh, and uh, the second uh, instance that I wanted to just talk about was about a young boy of 19 who, who came to us uh, very frightened, but he was describing, he, he was a day scholar, he was trying to rush back through all of this melee to his home. The police picked him up and he described his hand was broken uh, by the police lathis and he said they kept twisting his arm to cause him more pain. He, he talked about uh, a number of com communal slurs being used. Uh, he, he talked about uh, communal slurs being used by the police throughout their detention. Uh, he talked about being stripped naked with the other boys and beaten with a belt. He had welt marks of, of, of being beaten across his body, uh, which he showed us. Uh, many students and teachers spoke about uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Rapid Action Force actually uh, raising slogans of Jai Shri Ram, you know, running like a rampaging uh, mob, burning scooters, burning property, chasing students. Uh, they also chased them, they ran wherever they could and uh, uh, through you know, terror of about three or four hours, uh, one group of students spoke to me and said that they, they, they just ran into the mosque and were hiding for, for all of those hours behind the curtains, just hoping that nobody would find them. Somebody else went into the guest house. Some ran into hostels. They were chased into the hostels. We saw the room where uh, the three boys were inside their own room and uh, uh, they uh, fired uh, into it. I don't know whether it was tear gas shells, but it could have been the stun grenade because uh, their room caught fire. And it, it was like, like you hole out, uh, out, out uh, terrorists, that kind of action. It reflects the attitude of the st state administration to students. It is something 
they could never have done even in JNU. And, and there is something about how they are treating higher uh, uh, institutes of higher learning which are seen as identified with, uh, 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 with the Muslim community. Uh, they could not have done this anywhere else. They could not have thought they could get away with it. Uh, and we felt we needed to, to prepare this report and also to say this clearly because they should not be allowed to get, get away with it. Uh, we need to know. I'm sure that everything that we have said in this report will be contested and therefore I've given a caveat that I alone take personal responsibility uh, for everything that is stated in this report. If anyone has to take any action, they'll have to take action. Uh, I think the most contested question, and I'll leave it at that, is, is whether there was violence by the students uh, which set this off or whether it was unprovoked. It's hard to, uh, uh, hard to reach a final conclusion about it. Uh, I'm told Republic TV is just at this time repeatedly carrying uh, pictures of violence uh, by the Aligarh students. Um, my, my answer to that is that even if there was violence, uh, what the police did was completely disproportionate and there has to be a proportionality of response, there has to be restraint. This is what we, were, we are always taught and uh, particularly when you're dealing with civilian populations, particularly when you're dealing even more so when you're dealing with students in universities. So even if there was any violence like stone throwing uh, by students, which we cannot verify, uh, none of that in justifies the scale and the nature of the police response and the response of the RAF, RAF that followed this. My generation older generation have been students of Aligarh. I have, Aligarh is a second home to me. Adib Bhai is sitting here and he knows. Um, my ancestor Altaf Hussain Hali, the poet who was India's first feminist poet, from him on to his next generation and next generation and next generation, all were students of Aligarh. And before coming to this uh, press conference, I looked at some of the autobiographies and each one of them spoke so glowingly of what Aligarh had given them. What Aligarh had given them in the form of the vice chancellors that were there, in terms of the academic faculty that was there and the values of life that they got right from the time of Sir Sayyid and his uh, Tehzeebul Akhlaq, which was a journal which actually changed the face and the sentiment of the Muslim community. But as Harsh said and as Natasha said and John said, two universities being targeted both, one with the name, both with the name Muslim is something which we need to think about. We also need to think about that Aligarh is a university where the vice chancellor was Dr. Zakir Hussain. Dr. Zakir Hussain, whose house is located right in the heart of Jamia, even today. I also live in Jamia. I live in Jamia, and in a sense, I also live in Aligarh. And I also have, as even last month, I was in that very guest house where some students were hiding that you wrote about in your report where I had gone to do a commemorative lecture on Maulana Abul Kalam Azad. Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, who said Aligarh was the markers of Indian Renaissance. So basically, I'm here because of my, the, my historical memory and the fact that, that in Aligarh, the staff of Aligarh, the teachers of Aligarh stood solidly behind the students. So, as Natasha said, Muslims, because of their dress, and I don't know what my dress is, I, I've always worn this dress, I've never worn anything which distinguished me in a sense or was a marker, but Muslims are the f number one target across this country. And everybody, Natasha, you rightly said, and John and Harsh has been behind it. It has to be that that entity has to be now looked at with different eyes. 
even as you're getting tweets from your friends who's photo who are being photographed and videoed by the security forces. As far as registrar being fr a retired IPS or a serving IPS officer, Jamia also has a registrar who is, I think, probably a retired I IPS officer of the Himachal Kader. But whenever I call him, he never even answers my phone you know, through all this. Um, I also want to say that when Harsh said that I have never seen what I saw in Aligarh, I remember that it was 2002 that you decided that you were going to resign from your service as an IAS officer. And what you have seen in 2002 and what you have seen in Aligarh, I think those eyes have seen a lot that we need to learn from. Uh, the hand blown, the broken hand, the twisting of broken bones, the fact that stun grenades were hurled, the fact that students hid both in Jamia and in Aligarh in toilets, in guest houses, in girls' hostels, there is a long story that hangs there. Inst Institute of Higher Learning Identified with Muslims what was what Harsh said. And I think that is where we need to look at Aligarh. And we also need to know that there is internationally, there is a very strong Aligarh alumni across the world, and Adib Bhai knows about them, all over the world. And there is now a demand that there should be action. The vice chancellor should resign. I've got a lot of mails from Aligarh alumni in all, all parts of the world which, are, which want action to be taken. <coughs> and I have to say, I'm, I'm going to end here, but I'm going to say that this is an, a very expressive, very moving, extremely well-written report, which has a lot of veracity and shows a lot of tenacity on the part of the team that had gone, who had investigated. And I think if not for this report, Aligarh would have remained something which would have ultimately faded in the public memory. But this report is going to make sure that we don't forget the fact that Aligarh has been the target. Aligarh has been the target as, as all Muslim institutions have been targeted. But the tragedy of Aligarh is that from within Aligarh, the highest decision-making authority, the highest office was not able to respond. In fact, as John said, it was completely misrepresented that the vice chancellor was not even on the campus. This is very serious, and I think this needs to be highlighted by the media. Thank you. First of all, I would like to uh, say that the report that we have presented to you, we all stand by it. We are all responsible for it and we all own responsibility for it. It is not just Harsh. He took the lead, he took the courage in his hand, and we went there. He has given you a very broad outline. I and uh, Professor Nandini Sundar took time off from when Harsh and the team were talking to the staff council in the hall. We went and met in the fortified building that is the administration of AMU, we went to meet the Vice Chancellor. He was not there, we were told. He had been summoned by the visitor, that is the President of India, and had come to Delhi. In retrospect, it was a lie. And he was just trying to avoid us, he knew we were coming. So we did meet the Registrar a serving Indian Police Service officer of the 2007 batch who's going to become a DIG in February or April or March 2020 and is eagerly looking forward to his promotion. The current serving superintendent of Aligarh is his immediate senior in service, the chumps. The vice chancellor himself we were told is uh, very 
close to the administration and in fact had invited the DG and the IGP of the range to visit the university some time ago, some months ago, not a long time ago. So that's the general battle. But when we were talking to the policeman, our oblique registrar, apart from his arrogance, we asked him who asked the police inside the campus. Did you? Or did the vice chancellor? He says the vice chancellor has authorized me to call in the police. Nandini and I repeatedly asked him, and he was firm on his reply, that he was deputed or the responsibility had been delegated upon him. Secondly, because we knew the case of the boy, a young man whose hand had been blown off, we asked him what sort of a weapon was that? Could it have been a tear gas shell that explodes? It happens once in a while. He was firm, he's a serving IPS officer. He says it was a stun grenade. Repeatedly we asked him, stun grenades, where do you bring in stun grenades into a university? But he was firm. So when we write stun grenade in this report, it is straight from the mouth of the person who, in a way, authorized that. And from there I would like to add a few sentences to what Harsh has already said. It is this militarization of the response that I'd like to comment on. I think we have gone far beyond the lottery charge. Severe as it is, I've faced lottery charges and I've been in hospital myself long years ago. It's gone beyond water cannon, which is also disastrous if it hits you in the belly. It has gone beyond tear gas, which can blind you, which can also, if it hits you in the belly, at close range, kill you. Here you're using stun guns, stun grenades, which are normally you, you see on CNN, where they use stun grenades into bunkers to flush out terrorists of the ISIS or something of that sort. It makes a flash, it, the ear-splitting noise can burst your eardrums and you have no option but to come out. And then the, the catch you or shoot you or not to charge you or whatever, as they have in mind. And at this militarization, which we saw and read about elsewhere, the immediate use of guns on, on innocent, unarmed people is, is something that is horrendous and needs to be condemned uh, by, by, by just about everybody. The third is, of course, uh, Harsh has already dealt on it, the sanctity of the campus. You know, uh, it doesn't, the word picture isn't very clear. One door is here and the other gate is there. Uh, kilometers almost, you would say, between the two. For them to enter jeep or whatever and go into the hostel, uh, a very ancient building, go into the rooms and do this stun gunning inside. Well, what, where could be the need? Who were they chasing? Enemy forces or what? The staff themselves were not very secure. And this also I thought I, I, I should spell out. Largely, I personally would not want to say something is less violent than something is more violent. JNU, Aligarh, what has happened in Delhi, in Jama Masjid, in Darya Ganj. All of them stand at that level beyond expectations, beyond tolerance, and certainly therefore beyond acceptance by any civil society. And please understand, even when they are so-called detaining you, <coughs> it is not a very pleasant experience that I tell you from my own experience. Thank you. This was my second um, visit to Aligarh Muslim University. I had gone there a couple of years ago. My husband is alumni of uh, AMU. He spent six years of his youth there. And I had gone there with my family. It was uh, like a weekend picnic, traveling, walking all over the campus. It had been empty when I had gone there five years ago. It was still empty, but the atmosphere had completely changed. This visit was like uh, visiting the ruins of a university, in a sense. There was so much eeriness, so much silence, so much desolation. 
and such despair both in the eyes and faces of the teachers who had seen it being destroyed in front of them in the eyes of the students some of whom from assam and uh, kashmir did not have the means or the destination to be able to leave uh, the campus so far so they were skulking around in the silence of the women who were sitting at the gate uh, women students who were sitting near the gate that had been uh, you know re it had been put back in place after the police had broken it uh, on the 15th there were 20 women students sitting on the footpath uh, most of them, some of them had dupattas on their uh, mouth, some of them had just uh, tied something on their mouth. It was a silent protest in the cold, in this isolation, not knowing if there is anybody who is going to come to lend a hand, who is going to come to look at them, who is going to come to listen to their protest uh, or, or witness what they are going through. They were still sitting there. We entered in the Early afternoon, we left at night and they were still there, uh, quietly sitting there in protest, knowing that they will be targeted, knowing that this, uni this campus has seen violence, it can see it again. Uh, they still had the courage and the bravery to, to sit through, to, to, to say, we will continue to be here, you can come for us if you want. It was really uh, an extraordinary, experience i think most of us as we went as we listened to the teachers we heard the proctor we we heard the violence in their language in their attitude in their in their body language when they took on uh, people like harsh mandar to say don't tell us what how we are supposed to behave on our own campus and they had to be reminded that he he's a senior uh, xis officer who has seen similar uh, stuff who has dealt with situations before. The, the uh, atmosphere in the hospital where we went into the ICU ward, there were two students, one of them broke down. At the sight of the support that we were offering him, you know, a, and two of them in the burns wards uh, where one had lost his hand and the other had lost some fingers. So, in a way, at some point in the day, most of us became too stunned to feel anything. We became too numb. And it was in the recalling when we began to take phone calls after we came out of the university, <coughs> out of the city, and our phones came into range. And people were able to reach us again. It was then when we were beginning to answer. Uh, some of us got calls from colleagues, from journalists, from family members that we began to find the words to express, we began to even experience or feel the horror of what we had witnessed. It was really in the recalling that the words came to us, that the university ko barbaad kar diya hai. How will the sense of belonging that students have for the universities that nurture them ever be restored after the kind of violence that has been perpetrated on the students in broad daylight, in the knowledge of the whole world, how will that sense of belonging ever be restored? How will uh, AMU become AMU again uh, is a question that we are uh, really left with. And what we, what I also want to say is that what we saw in Aligarh Muslim University, what we had seen live on our Twitter and Facebook feeds, on social media, as well as mainstream media, on the Sunday when Jamia University was attacked by police personnel. You know, we're, we're no, but Aligarh does not have enough videos to offer us to show us what the students were doing before the police entered, but Jamia does. They were sitting in the library. Yeah, there, there were students trying to save themselves because they were getting asthma attacks from the tear gas and they were still being attacked. There is a library still standing in Jamia that is completely destroyed because tear gas, sh gas shells were thrown inside. We have videos of women students in the washroom being attacked, hostels attacked. So these were not students who were in any way being violent. A couple of days ago when the Lati charge happened in Delhi, the whole day 
citizens, many of uh, whom are in the room here, were coming to Mandi House, coming to Jantar Mantar, coming to Lal Kila, being picked up in buses, detained. Yes, that was humiliation enough. When did the Lati charge start? When daylight began to dim? And where did the Lati charge happen? At Delhi Gate, at Darya Ganj, targeting a particular community. So we are really witnessing a, a new kind of riot. This is representatives of the state against the people of India in, in almost every instance that we are watching. And we are, we are standing with bated breath every day on our WhatsApp. We get a message from somebody or the other, violence expected in Shaheen Bagh, come there. You know, so people like us, people of privilege in the big cities who have a voice, who know, who have platforms where we can speak. We really, this is a time when all of us have to put ourselves physically, psychologically, emotionally as a body between the community that is being targeted, the students who are being targeted, and the state, which is really not going to stop before they have got what Aditya Nath said, uh, badla, badla lenge, uh, you know, their vengeance for having uh, called them out. So we are, this is not, a, a, you know, a one instance of violence that this press conference is about, not one location of violence that this press conference is about. We are really here um, to, 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 to communicate to each other, to understand that we are in a very historic moment in independent India. Lacks of people are coming out in every city that we hear of. Um, everybody's surprised by it. We are all, uh, it, there's a little bit of a sense of disbelief. How long will it last? But we now know that we have to make it last long enough. As I was sitting here, uh, colleagues are sending me uh, photos from the rally outside where policemen are videotaping the faces of every protester out there. These people are going to be targeted and we have to be continue, we have to continue to stand and speak and put ourselves in front of them so that they do not face the kind of violence that Aligarh Muslim University has already um, had to face and had to suffer and the students of Jamia and Delhi University and all over India and, and the minority community, the Muslim community communities that are being targeted in UP right now as we stand here. Uh, people are being arrested, they are being picked up from their homes, uh, properties are being destroyed, the videos are coming in constantly. So we really, this is a moment of great vigilance that needs action from all of us. Thank you. Let me summarize not only what we've heard here today, but what we've been seeing with our own eyes, on television, in newspapers, through friends, over the last one month, one could say, perhaps we should say one year, perhaps we should say two years, and go on and on. Our brave youth, students and otherwise, have actually shown us what it is to have courage, what it is to have endurance, what it is to have that wonderful thing that human beings have had throughout history, solidarity. They have not come for you, perhaps. You have a particular name. You wear certain clothes, our Prime Minister tells us. Well, tomorrow they might come for you. And that is why solidarity keeps the human race going. But most important, I'm going to summarize by three or four very, very simple questions, simple but terribly important for us to address at this point and find answers and move on the basis of these answers, act on the basis of these answers. One is, what is a young person for? What is a student for? What is a university for? These are not facetious questions. A young person, all of us have families. Our lives, however old we are, would be impoverished without young people. 
Young people are there to show us what experiment is, what questioning is. They're not yet jaded. They will ask why. And that is why they are in the university. The point of the university, the point of being young, the point of being a student, the point of being a teacher is to say, ask as many questions as you want. And it's these questions which, with varying answers, will give them ideas, will give them language, language which is important, which is learned. You know, we talk about students, were they violent? Well, I'm sorry, what are they learning in this university? They're learning the violence of language. They're learning real life violence. They're learning war in a university. War to win an argument, not words and ideas and arguments to disagree, to debate. That is the point of the university. Please, let's remember this. Let's not say students should be sheep. Let's not say the police. The police have no role in the education of students. We've all brought up children without having police come into our homes. We've had difficult children who occasionally siblings will say we will, we will kill the other person. It doesn't happen. This is just extended. This is all common sense, which is common wisdom. So the university is a space which teaches all of us how to communicate. It does not flourish without argument. It does not flourish if you shut down the internet. It does not flourish if you say, we will withhold technology so you can't communicate with each other. <coughs> what then, on the basis of this, I could ask a question. We're talking about the university as a space for doubt, disagreement, debate, questioning. How can we have universities like this? What is a constitution for? The Constitution is there to give us certain rights, which again and again, let's repeat till we believe it, till we make it real, equality, right to worship or not worship, and most of all, that freedom of speech. What does it mean? It includes the right to question, to disagree, to dissent. It does not mean that dissent in a constitutional democracy is dealt with with lati charge, stun grenades, all these new things we have learned from this fact-finding report. What is a citizen for? It is to claim these rights which the constitution gives the citizen. Which is why we don't want to talk about the son of the soil or the, of course, nobody talks about daughters of the soil. The citizen the human being. Finally, I'm just going to say, what is India for? It is to keep the diversity alive. And if we don't keep this diversity alive by insisting on a constitution that insists on our diversity, if we do not let our youth question and show us and indulge in debate and dialogue with our youth, we are going to lose all these and we are actually going to find out the negative. What is a citizen not for? What is a university not for? And what are youth and students not for? Thank you.